Welcome to Cybermania, Cyber Talks with the Brightest Minds in Cybersecurity. Discussing risks, AI, emerging threats, workforce challenges, and more. Brought to you by Cyber Range Solutions. With your host, May Brooks. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cybermania. And with me today is Sasha Cohen O'Connell, an executive in resident and senior professorial lecturer at American University. Sasha, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. So, as always, we always start the same way with you telling us a little bit about your very, very special background story. What drew you into cybersecurity and what do you do today? Sure, absolutely. And thanks again, May. It's so great to be here. I love this programming and I consider it an honor to be included. So thanks again for having me live from Washington, D.C. here at American University. So yeah, I'm a bit of an accidental cyber person. I, my background academically is in public administration. So both my master's and PhD are from American University, where I am full time now. And from that background, which is really focused on decision making in the executive branch of government. I joined the FBI. I tell my students today 150 years ago, but it was in fact 1998 um, where I joined the FBI. And so I spent a total of about 15 years at the Bureau, over 20 years, because I had a little break in service where I did some consulting and some work in academia and I returned. But the kind of core beginnings of my career at the FBI as a non-agent policy and strategy for person was all focused on just that strategy. And and my first leadership role was helping Director Mueller implement the balanced scorecard. And in that context, cyber was a priority, right? It came to the front for the FBI. And so in that capacity, I got the opportunity to really learn a lot at the time about cyber as defined by the FBI. And that was cyber as defined by Um, worrying about attribution when um, incidents happen, right? That's sort of the, that is my, I own my bias today. That's how, where I start from when I think about cyber. And then over time, and I think maybe, maybe we can talk about this a bit more. I was asked to stand up and lead um, an externally facing office at the FBI. So the FBI had always had three externally facing offices, one to interact with Congress, so congressional affairs, one to, um, do press, so public affairs office, makes sense, and then one to do law enforcement coordination in the FBI's role as a leader in the law enforcement community, um, certainly here in the United States with our state and local law enforcement. But Director Mueller had an idea for two additional offices and Director Comey put those into place, both highly relevant to cyber and tech policy as well. One for private sector engagement, so in its 100 plus year history, the FBI had never had a central coordination point to connect with the private sector, something obviously so critical in cyber. And then the other piece, um, which was stood up that I was asked to lead was a White House facing office, specifically an office focused on the policy work happening at the National Security Council to help the FBI kind of more strategically engage. And that was the office I was asked to stand up and lead as one of my last roles there. It was in that capacity, right? You can again, imagine the priorities bubbling to the top, cyber and tech policy and related matters. So that's where I really kind of rolled up my sleeves. So again, I'm not a technical person. I'm a government decision-making strategy and policy person, but the environment really demanded that I move that direction. And I have, um, and I've learned an incredible amount and I really have come to love it. Today, I work full-time at American University. As you said, I both teach as a senior professorial lecturer. I teach US cyber policy at the undergraduate, graduate, and occasionally at the executive education level. And then I have a series of other really fun responsibilities, including we created and I lead our graduate certificate in cyber policy and management. And I'm the head of curriculum and programming for the Khan Institute for Cyber and Economic Security here at AU. So a really fun uh, kind of portfolio that keeps me really focused on cyber and cyber education in particular. Amazing. Well, you just referenced a few things that I have almost zero knowledge about. I'm okay, going let's to go. Do your knowledge. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Sure. Um, I think that we can't avoid the, the topic of the main players in the US cybersecurity policy making sphere, which sure. also have such a huge impact globally. So who are those players? 
Who makes the policy? Who, who are those who players? Are they? <laughs> who are they? I actually teach a course called Who's Who in U.S. Cyber Policy. And so let me first stop and say, and I kind of already you know, referred to this, but I think there is a somewhat arbitrary distinction, certainly in the United States, and maybe you can help tell me whether this exists globally as well, but sort of defining cyber cyber policy is separate from tech and tech policy. So here in the States, again, it's in my mind arbitrary and frankly unhelpful, but in understanding who's who, the first thing is to understand that the national security and homeland security kind of security community tends to think about cyber policy. And we can talk about that set of players. There's also tech policy, right? Uh, internet access for all, content moderation, right? Some of these things, of course, have security implications. But when you start to think about who's who in the U.S. government, it is important to just keep in mind that while they really are, I think, two sides of the same coin, there are both tech policy organizations and agencies and more cyber related. So with that in mind, and not to be completely inclusive, I'm sure I'll forget somebody, and I already apologize if I leave anyone out. So of course we have Congress, right? <laughs> of course we have Congress. And it is a very complicated, and I, I get to say now as an academic, you know, suboptimal setup in terms of the committees and subcommittees and roles and responsibilities in cyber. So for globally global folks interested in getting a little bit of a snapshot, I would highly recommend the 2020 Cyberspace Solarium Report. And that was a bipartisan, so both Republicans and Democrats, bicameral, so that's Senate and House, um, report that was issued that really, um, really exemplifies strategy and also has a lot of legislative proposals in it about how the US government can better lead on cyber. And one of the things in there, if you're interested in what's happening on Capitol Hill are some recommendations about reorganizing committees and subcommittees in Congress. Those haven't gone anywhere, but that's a really good place to look if you're interested in sort of that end of, we would say Pennsylvania Avenue of Capitol Hill. In terms of the other end of Capitol Hill, if you think about the White House, um, there's a couple nodes or you know epicenters of cyber and tech policy within the White House itself. And one of my pet peeves, May, is when the press says like the White House is deciding something, right? Like who, who in the White House, right, is deciding something? So again, I love talking about these things and could talk about it all day. But a little bit of a um, a little bit of a primer is number one. I already mentioned the National Security Council, so that is at the epicenter of the White House. And within the National Security Council, there is what's called a cyber directorate that is leading on a lot of these issues on behalf of the president. In addition, over the last, I guess, two, two and a half years now, the White House has created an office of the National Cyber Director. So ONCD, a relatively new position that was born out of that Cyber Solarium Commission report and recommendations. So that's a Senate confirmed lead. So in addition to having leadership in the NSC, we also have leadership in the ONCD, the Office of the National Cyber Director. Just a little note, also in the White House, there are many other kind of components that are relevant here. The Office of Science and Technology Policy, for example, kind of focuses more on that tech policy side, but of course has um, influence and something to say on cyber issues, the National Economic Council and others. These are components within the White House that are very much involved in interagency policy development. In terms of the executive branch, we have enforcement agencies like FBI, you know, based on my background, I'll start there. Of course, U.S. Secret Service has responsibilities as well in the cyber realm. Of course, CISA is the lead federal agency for resilience, and they have leadership um, around mitigation and resilience. And there's increasingly, and this is something that's changed since my time, a very close relationship between CISA and those enforcement agencies. You know, I, I show my students back in probably 2007, there's something called the bubble chart that I think you can still find online if you look. And it's a rough PowerPoint slide that we used in government to articulate roles and responsibilities. And it really highlights some of the folks I have mentioned, uh, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, DHS, for example. 
But if you fast forward to 2020, there is a um, government accounting office, a GAO report that came out in 2020 that shows all the executive branch agencies that have cyber responsibility. And that has bloomed, as you can imagine, into a very <laughs> robust chart that I think has 25 or 30 um, executive branch agencies as well. Yeah, it's really wild. And that includes, of course, regulatory agencies, right? Even traditional agencies that don't have a lead cyber responsibility, like the Security and Exchange Commission or the SEC, as we see over the last year and right now playing a really important role in cyber, even though we don't think of them as a cyber first agency, which is why I say for current leaders in government and my students, future leaders, it's cyber for all in government, right? There's, there's a piece for everybody. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that today, unlike probably 20, 30 years ago, with technology in general and cyber in particular, playing such an important role in everyone, in everyone's lives, in every single business. I can't think of a single business today that doesn't use technology to some extent. So everyone needs to understand cybersecurity. And you mentioned the SEC, and but we've seen it. A long time ago, we've seen it with even with Servants and Oxley, we've seen it with HIPAA. HIPAA is not a cybersecurity act, but for all intended purposes, it is because the way we implement it is via information security or cybersecurity. And I want to reference what you just said. You talked about interagency relationship, and we'll talk about the global side in a second, but I want to still stay in the sort of understanding the players and talking about the difference between different, let's call it policies that people have to adhere to because we have executive orders and we have regulations and we have legislation and we have a lot of things and we have frameworks and we have recommendations. So what are the main differences between those tech policies and not just tech policies in general that I just mentioned and other than I probably forgot? Yes, it's such a good question. I mean, I think in simplest terms, the way to start to think about breaking that all down is to think about, first of all, who the audience is, right? Which sector it is, for example, with a regulation, they would apply to that regulated space. As you mentioned, healthcare, for example, or finance or energy. So that's one way to think about it. And so as um, an individual or as a company, you want to sort of start there and think about, okay, are there regulations that relate to me in my particular space, given what I do and who my customers are, for example, for sure, that's number one. Number two, of course, is the law, right? And there's Congress legislation. There's remarkably little actually in this space, right? But there is some. But what's also interesting in the United States is that then there can be state laws as well, which gets very complicated if you're a tech company. And for example, in the United States, all 50 states have a victim notification law in cyber, but many are different, right? And so that's something to consider as well. In terms of executive orders, it really depends. The real power of the White House is the bully pulpit, right? Sort of setting a vision. So most of the time, those executive orders tend to be, not always, but when it trickles down are really voluntary in, in for unregulated in particular organizations, but set a path or they set a path for the federal agencies who then use their authorities, right? Or sort of look at their authorities to then have that impact. We, of course, in the Commerce Department have NIST, right, and NIST standards. So there's those whole voluntary set of pieces out there. And then you have the example of the SEC, right, very much non-voluntary and, and public disclosure requirements now. So it is a real set. I would say one of the nice things I've seen come along over the last couple of years are organizations in the states who do a nice job by topic, laying out all the rules and responsibilities. And frankly, some of the law firms here in DC do an amazing job and they make that publicly available in terms of crosswalks by topic. So you can really see, and I know we'll get to it, but also in the international context as well, right? Because not just our tech companies, for most of our companies and businesses, many are global now. And so have to also consider those international frameworks. So that work of mapping and then and then racking and stacking is something that again 
academics. I see our partners in law firms and policy shops. And frankly, the White House and the Office of National Cyber Director, too, are all working on to make sure people have clarity in what's expected of them. Absolutely. I know that we've worked on it in with IC2 when I was working yeah. on the CISSP in 2021 when we released the previous version. In two weeks, is, there's going to be a new one. Um, mm. We're recording it end of March. So, yes, when we were working on the CISSP in 2021, it was a big issue trying to understand those global contexts, what's going on in the EU, what's going on in the US, how does one thing impact the other and of course i'm referencing gdpr but not just gdpr what? and when that's something i've always i always told, told my students i always talk to my colleagues about what's going on right now in the us will probably happen in the uk in two years what's going on in the uk now might impact what's going on in the uae two two weeks from now or two years from now i don't know and sometimes i see it being someone who's working in the, the global sphere and i did relocate I see like people tell me, oh, there's a brand new phishing attack here, let's say in the UAE. I'm looking at it, this is new? Yes. This is, this is four years old, are you, are you kidding me? But here it's new and yep. vice versa. Yeah. So I think that the more we have that global inputs, the more we have global connections will be better for us as a community. But I'm drifting. So <laughs> let's stay on the topic. And you said that you were in the FBI. So I want to talk about cybercrime. And we know that one of the biggest issues with cybercrime is the fact that it's a global it's a global issue. Mm -hmm. You can have someone attack a company in France and they'll be sitting in, I don't know, in the in Barbados. So mm -hmm. that's a huge issue both to find them and to bring them to justice. Can you shed some light about the global impacts on policy making first and actual, actually trying to get things done? We've seen it recently, the task force with Lockbit takedown, but it's not the only one. So I would love to have your input on that. Sure, I think maybe two ways to answer this. First on the operational side in terms of you mentioned response, information sharing, in terms of that future mitigation and all, all of those pieces. I think the great news is, and I can speak for the FBI, in terms of the lessons learned, even in the, the fight against terrorism globally, about the importance of those partnerships and the importance of the task force model, right? And that this is a team sport, right? As the FBI always says, there is no, there is no solo operator globally in cyber. And so those long held sort of integrated partnerships, some of the infrastructure, for example, I'm sure you know, FBI has legat offices around the world. So they're physically now deployed along with other federal law enforcement partners. And I believe CISA is some places overseas as well. So there's that person to person kind of on the ground connection. There's the global task force model that operates at every level to make sure people are talking to each other. And of course that back end infrastructure always so challenging around appropriate information sharing while protecting data. So on the operational side, there's always room to grow. But in my experience, in my career, I've seen you know the community kind of build on past successes and frankly lessons learned to make sure it is approached um, as a team sport, right? As Director Ray always says. On the policy side too, I mean, the integration is critical. What comes to mind for me is when I was at the FBI, there was one person who worked on this project called internet governance. And to be honest, nobody really knew what that was all about. And he traveled the world and went to some meetings and some, maybe something about the who is lookup and attribution, but no one really got it. And today, the need for the FBI, for example, but more broadly, the national security community to be involved in conversations that are happening globally around internet governance, who is kind of being a classic example, but there are many others. If you think about phishing, right, as the main vector now to securing legitimate credentials that then are, we know the primary vector now into serious cyber incidents, you know, getting to the root of some of that, there's there's sort of multiple approaches, but of course, a piece of that is that global in, international infrastructure around standards and protocols. That, that is a global fight, right? And a global policy conversation. So 
you know, having the players here in the states, both the private sector and government, both the folks looking out for free expression and free speech and protecting individuals and folks concerned about access and folks concerned about security, all participating globally, right? in that policy conversation that at the time when I first heard about internet governance at the FBI seemed very far from our mission, but I think people are really starting to understand. And today the FBI has a large team that's really focused on both intakes and proactive participation in those policy conversations because they really are at the root of addressing some of these critical threats. Absolutely. Well, to be honest, I was not aware of those relationships, and I think they're so important, those public-private partnerships mm -hmm. in understanding the problem, in shaping the policies. And I'm sure you can share, maybe you can share, um, a few examples of such successful partnerships and how it really impacted the way we see policies today. Yeah, absolutely. So it's hard for me to talk about specifics, um, but I can tell you in general some of the things that I have experienced and and how they work. So first of all, it can never be underestimated on the operational side. So really, in terms of investigation and prosecution, the importance identification too of private sector partners for the government in the United States, and all of course done within the rule of law with oversight as appropriate from judges. Um, but again, the, the partnerships, the relationships, so the engineers talking to each other from the government and companies as needed, the lawyers, of course, talking to each other as needed to make sure everything is done um, to protect um, and be within both the spirit and the letter of the law and to, to really protect data and only have access as court authorized or as needed in this case. So operationally though, through that task force model, through those individual relationships, again, always under the auspices of court authorization as needed, you know, the private sector owns the content, owns the data, owns the pipes, right? So there are no investigations without some kind of integration. Um, so that's always going on at the operational level. And again, I've seen, those that infrastructure, that ability to connect um, when needed only improve over time. And again, I mentioned the FBI has a new Office of Private Sector Coordination to make sure they're sort of capturing those right contacts and being responsive. Um, and there's necessary oversight too, to be frank. On the policy side, same thing. It's so interesting. When I was at the FBI working interagency policy, um, you know, there really were, there was less activity from the private sector in terms of engagement on these issues. Most of the large tech companies had small policy shops in Washington that were focused on things like tax policy and HR policy, obviously important, right? Um, but for a number of interesting reasons over the last kind of eight years, the growth of policy teams coming out of the tech and cyber private sector communities has really bloomed here in DC. And I think that's a wonderful thing um, so that we're hearing from technologists about what's possible, about what their needs are, about how they see the world. And there's a better ongoing dialogue um, here in Washington, facilitated by trade groups, right? Sort of our traditional mechanism for that. But also the White House has come a long way in terms of integrating fellows from the private sector, both at the White House and then throughout the executive branch. I know Congress has taken on the same. So there really has been a wonderful growth. And of course, good policy comes from, you know, robust give and take, because again, you know, the government can, can have ideas, right? And can be driven by Congress by the laws, but at the end of the day needs to understand um, the realities that the private sector is working with, with these tools. Oh, absolutely. Well. One of the things that I always had sort of, I won't say an issue, but it is an issue. Something that I remember even from my BA studies a uh, thousand and one years ago, that we talked about the fact that the law takes time to respond to what they see. Now, when we're talking about technology in general and specifically cybersecurity, we know that cybersecurity changes so rapidly and we know technology changes so rapidly. Two years ago, no one talked about AI, and now there's like, we don't talk about anything else, basically. I want to hear from your side as a policymaker. Mm -hmm. How do policymakers tackle that problem? Tackle the, it takes so long to pass, a, to pass legislation. It takes years, at least from my experience in Israel, it takes yeah. years. How do you do it in such 
an evolving landscape? It's such a good question and it is a huge challenge, obviously. I think you really, you know, put a fine point on it. One of the things, and we just launched a podcast, as you know, called Start Here, which is about cybersecurity policy fundamentals for policymakers. And, and one of the things that's the goal of that podcast really gets to this question that the recommendation for policymakers, legislators, regulators, executive branch folks, is to make sure you're clear on what problem you're trying to solve, right? Not sort of chasing the issue of the day. Let's take ransomware, for example, right? An obvious um, epidemic today. Ransomware, yes. Is that going to continue to change? Yes. So well, let's think about when addressing this critical threat, right, that policymakers are certainly rushing toward. What's the actual problem? It's extortion is what we're talking about here, right? So to take a little bit more of a generalized view and to understand these issues in a broader context of previous public policy successes and failures, right? And again, instead of chasing that particular implementation or technology, really understand what the policy matter is at play and to think about a more generalizable solution that obviously you know, mitigates negative <laughs> outcomes and maximizes addressing that that actual issue. One of the things it's so easy to get distracted, as you said, with the technology of the day or the threat of the day or the threat actor of the day. And as you said, once you get a law in place, right, you can be stuck with things <laughs> and leave people <laughs> non-compliant that, that it's really irrelevant. So it is a place that I think is very challenging, particularly, right, when things get political and heated and are on the front page or people are demanding solutions, right? So we're trying to help support that effort to slow down a little bit, not slow down and in delivery, but slow down in terms of thought process and the dialogue and inform that dialogue. And that's where I'm excited about a role for non-technical folks like me to be able to facilitate that kind of policy conversation, of course, with an understanding of the technology, but also so importantly, an understanding of the context. And again, an eye on what problem we're really trying to solve from a public policy perspective. Absolutely. I absolutely love it because I think that that's something that I've seen from my side I've seen regulation specifically evolve over the, over the years because if I'm talking about 15 years ago, a lot of regulations, at least in the Israeli slash EU areas, were very specific. They even almost they almost told you which technology to use to solve a specific problem, right. and like that was great when you wrote this policy in 2004, but now it's 2007 and that company went out of business or was acquired three times already. So I can't use what you meant. I can use something else that will do the same thing. And I remember those conversations back in 2008, 2010, when I was relatively starting out. And I remember having those conversations with the re regulator and telling him, look, it does exactly the same thing. It's just a different product. It's exact. It's it's exactly what you wanted, but it's a different product. So I think that's absolutely, I think that that's sort of a maturity that we see in the entire industry from, from both sides, from the technical side and from the policymaking side. Um, yeah. I think and if I can make a plug just once again, right, for the non-technical public policy and public administration folks, right, whether they're coming out of programs academically or they're already in government globally, we have experience having taking that public policy and making it more outcome focused versus that specificity and prescription in other areas, healthcare, energy, right? The list goes on. So this is one of my passions is making sure we're bringing together those interdisciplinary teams that, you know, while things like generative AI seem new, we know even that example isn't <laughs> entirely new, right? But also yep. these challenges and these problems. And I know Director Easterly and others in the U.S. government always give the examples of automobiles and kind of that iteration of something that's so incredibly convenient and life altering and also had to sort of go through voluntary and then mandatory safety pieces. Right. We have examples here. And so at every chance, I always make the case in this context that I think it is a maturity um, process and that bringing those interdisciplinary folks, folks from other policy fields together to share successes of what's worked, because Cyber is not the only place where technology changes, right? Or the environment changes and, and, and we need to be careful legislating too specifically. So yeah, it's a, there's lots of opportunity, I think, there. Absolutely. Well, I want to reference your work as in the academia. And I want to ask you, how do you 
gap that bridge between theory and technology and practice in security in policy making in general specifically cyber security but in general yep so one of the great assets of being at a university is having the capacity to convene people and and that people like to come because it's a neutral space and so having that opportunity to convene practitioners with academics right both private sector and government um, and academics to have conversations exactly about these topics and sometimes they're very specific and sometimes they're more general like how do we measure success of a cyber policy for example how do we measure success of a cyber strategy for example or what are some policy solutions for example around ransomware or where are we around data flows and so having that capacity to convene, when I got that role at the FBI, I mentioned, when I stood up and led the first White House facing office for the FBI, the first thing I did was say, where's everyone else in government who has my job, that externally facing White House job, so I can figure out how to do this, right? And there was no group to convene us. So we had to, of course, start a group, which we did, and that was very helpful. So one of my passions now on the academic side is convening government folks who don't have that chance to even talk to each other necessarily, right, from different segments of the government, and to make sure, on top of all the work they're already doing, they are getting opportunities with the private sector, which by and large they have, with academia, which frankly, by and large, they don't have. And then with our students to model careers and also to inform our students about what's possible across the spectrum, public, private, and academia. So we do a lot of that. It's a lot of work, but it's so rewarding because you know those connections, as you know, and that trust is really the engine that makes for good public policy in the end. Completely. And you talked about your students and basically how you're directed them. In my words, it will be you're directed them to have a network, to yes. build their network. And that's one of the things that I always found super useful. Just I have an issue. I'm not sure what to do next. I reach out to my network. And to this day, I have so many groups, one specifically for privacy and one specifically for hacking and one specifically for incident response, etc. And I know what I can ask the members in each of these. And when I want to implement a new product, I will go to my CISO team and ask them, uh, my CISO group and ask them, what do you think about this product? And did you work with that company? And I can't say how invaluable that those groups are. I, I couldn't people don't I, understand that. I could not agree more, May. To your point about how you possibly keep up, right, in this space, I mean, it, it is a mile a minute, as you mentioned, in the global policy sphere, just trying to keep up with what's going on, let alone the technology sphere. And so I work with my students on a couple of things. One, that network, I call it the phone-a-friend network. You need you need a phone-a-friend list, right? Like, mm -hmm. I want to explain quantum to me one more time, just try one more time, right, and explain quantum to me. Or a more specific question, right? Or a detail around a type of encryption. I need someone I know I can call and trust um, who will give me in a language I understand some help. Similarly, I know people who spend their days tracking privacy legislation globally, right? And I know that I can call and say, what happened in the last 30 days? Help me out. And they'll send me a chart, which is priceless. So having that phone a friend, and then I work with students too on identifying real-time media resources, right? Reporters globally and other organizations that are putting out reliable information that you can count on. It's really the only way, as you know, to, you can't keep on top of everything yourself, right? So it's a no. team report, again, just to keep, to keep a grasp and be able to make reasonably informed decisions requires a huge network. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's probably the most, if I could say, what's the one thing that I hope people will take from this conversation? Yeah. Network, 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 call a friend. I love that. Um, and don't forget your academic partners. We're out here and we're here for you. And yes. sometimes we think we're overlooked. We, we're we not super slow. We're, we're in the game. <laughs> we often have data is yes. all I'm saying. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have the resources to actually exactly. research things that the, the industry not necessarily has the time and the energy and the resources exactly. to do it, which is fantastic. Um, I wasn't planning to mention it, but now I really feel like doing it. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell me. First of all, I'm, yeah, I, I'm super happy by the fact that we're two women talking about cybersecurity. And we both come from very different mm -hmm. backgrounds. And we yeah. both found ourselves 
in cybersecurity. And that's one of the things I love about cybersecurity. People think that cybersecurity is a one clear path. No, there are a thousand different, a thousand different ways you can get into cybersecurity. So I want to hear from you about being a woman in cybersecurity, in policymaking, in law enforcement. Can you share a little bit about that, about what it's like to be a diverse person in this industry? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And, you know, I'm a mom, right? And I was an executive at the FBI who is not an agent. So there's agent, what we call 1811, kind of people with um, investigative authorities, right, at the FBI and non-agent. And I was one of a very small handful of women, non-agent, what we would call senior executive service executives at the Bureau. So um, that was a really amazing experience and an interesting experience. And then to continue on, I spent some time in consulting and obviously now at the university doing cyber. Yeah, still, I mean, incre it's getting better both in law enforcement and the national security community. It's getting better. And certainly in cyber, it's getting better. I mean, part of the answer, May, is I didn't know any better. I kind of grew up at the FBI, right? So, so <laughs> I kind of thought that's how the world worked. Like I, you know, I, I didn't really. I'm the really... only person, I'm the only woman in the room. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I, that's all, yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was, it kind of was what it was, right? For many, many years. It's only been since I left the Bureau that I've had time to reflect on, on how that impacted me as a person and on my worldview and, you know, it really was an incredible experience. And also, you know, one of the things I think is the most important thing that didn't, that wasn't around when I was sort of growing up the FBI that is so much better now that I encourage my students to take advantage of are affinity groups. So it's one thing to get the job, right? And it's one thing to be in meetings where you're the only woman, the only mom, the only non-agent, whatever it is, but making sure, again, you have that phone a friend, you have someone in your network that you can call, right, and say, this happened, and I didn't know what to say, and then you come up for, with something for the next time, right, that you really need, or this happened, is it me, or something like that. And, and at the time, I did have a group of both uh, men and women colleagues who were incredibly supportive at the Bureau. But today, there's been a proliferation of organizations. Um, LC Wins, NATSEC, Girl Squad, Women in Cybersecurity, right? The list goes on. And for me, taking part in those organizations and going to a conference or a meeting or being on a webinar with all women where we can meet new people and talk about some of these issues, the difference it has made for my students who I see who are still, right? You would think this is an an issue today, but it still is, of course, for the next generation. Yes. And having those affinity groups to make sure, again, you have that phone a friend and somebody to ask, you know, what do I wear to this meeting? Like, can I wear sneakers? Right? Like, and things change. The norms have changed so much. I'm an old dinosaur, right? But, you know, having those affinity groups has been everything. So, it's exciting to see it. I'm inspired by my students, all of them every day, in particular, the young women who are still, you know, sort of looking at a field that they will be a minority and going for it proudly. And, um, you know, bringing their full selves to that role has been has been awesome. Can I turn the tables and ask you, how has it been for you? <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not used to that. You put me on the spot. Huh? <laughs> well, I didn't know any better. Right. I still remember to this day, I was preparing to give a talk and I was backstage and a person came up to me and told me, um, we're out of water. I'm looking sure. at him. Okay. Yeah. Why, yeah. why are you telling me this? Oh, aren't you from the production? No. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it, I, it happened more than happens. once. So I know it still, still happens. happens to this day. Um, so they see a woman in a tech, oriented conference they assume she's from the protection so no usually i'm not from the protection usually i'm one of the speakers um exactly. but it's not easy i have to tell you one of the reasons i'm doing this i'm doing these podcasts i'm doing live speaking i'm teaching is for the next generation i'm not an what you call a natural public speaker a lot of people don't believe me when i tell them that but i'm not an extrovert i'm a, very much an introvert i I used to be terrified of public speaking. And the reason I started doing it was at some point I told myself, okay, if you continue saying no, 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 uh, no, 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 don't ask me. I, I can't speak. No, no, no. I'm not going to speak up. I won't be able to continue to complain about the fact that there aren't any women out there. If and every woman says no, we'll never be out there. 
And let me add to that too. I've, I had a similar experience where I did a lot of public speaking about the content of my job, but not about me, right? And it was very uncomfortable mm. to talk about leadership or me or being a woman. And I had a boss at the Bureau, Amy Hess, who is the executive assistant director of our science and technology branch, an incredible executive. And I had my first ask to do a leadership talk. And I said to her, I don't, I don't know, like, <laughs> it seems weird. And what she said, totally changed my attitude. And it's along the lines of what you just said, May, which is she said for her, she didn't have to see a woman in a role to know that she could do it. And, but she said, but there are women who do, right? And they're out there and they really need to know that you're out there and that you're doing these jobs. And so, yeah, you got to get out there, right? To your point. And you have to be a voice and you have to let the next generation of women know there are women in the room and you can absolutely do this. And that really changed me too. My attitude about talking, not just about the content of work, but about myself a little bit more and the feedback. I'm sure you've had the same from women our age, from younger women is just overwhelmingly positive and appreciative when you do put yourself out there. So I've had the exact same experience. That's amazing. That's so that's really amazing to hear. And that's the same story that I hear from many women mm -hmm. all over. So I absolutely love it. And thank you for sharing. And thank you for putting me on the spot. I appreciate it. Anytime. And sort of, yeah. And so sort of to wrap this up, you know, I always finish these interviews with quick pop quiz questions. First thing that comes to mind, super fun. So let's start. And if you haven't chosen a career for you, it's policymaking. What would you be doing today? I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, so I could have gone down that road. I now think I would like to be a producer for like the nightly news. How fun would that be? That'd be so fun. Those are my two mm -hmm. options. Cool. Very cool <laughs> options. You want to take care of where are my cats? I don't know where my cats are, but they're somewhere <laughs> around here. Um, amazing. Um, can you name someone who opened a door for you in, during your career when you didn't expect it? So many amazing people. Let me give one shout out to Ron Hosko, who was the assistant director of the criminal division of the FBI. Very operational, as they say, an agent's agent. Um, and he looked across the table at a meeting was like, I, I need you. I need you on my team, right? So um, we also recently lost former deputy director Mark Giuliano, passed away suddenly a couple of weeks ago from the from the FBI. Um, he was another boss who, you know, opened doors, appreciated a non-agent strategy woman, <laughs> and again, sort of looked across the organization and said, I need you over here to help me with things. You know, Sean Henry, who folks in the cyber community know well, similar, Amy Hess, who I mentioned. The list is really long, both at the Bureau and outside, and I am so grateful. And I always, as I know, you feel the same trying to pay that forward. Amazing. Um, is there a specific book you recently read that had nothing to do with cybersecurity, but really enriched you personally and professionally? So many, and so many podcasts mm. too. But I would mm. say um, mm. Scott, Scott Kelly's book about the year he spent on the International Space Station, if you haven't read it, it's a couple no. of years old now, it is a must read. I'm a person who loves to understand how things work and the writing style, the perspective, from living a year in the International Space Station, but also the details of what life is like. It's one of those books I just would read and, and reread if I could, I love it. Amazing, I will definitely pick it up. Um, is there a specific unexpected skill or hobby that helped you throughout your career? That's an interesting one. I think there's, let's see, I would say we joked a minute ago about being a vet and animals. I spend a lot of time, there's a horse and a dog and a cat in my life. And not only does it help me with my mental health and sanity, but it connects with people a lot. It's amazing talking about animals and pets and the, the sort of connection that makes. Similarly, I'm an active person. So yoga, biking, swimming, all those things. And growing up in, in this community, again, really important for my personal health and sort of sanity and balance. And also another way to connect with folks, either just talking about it or sometimes doing those activities. Certainly at the Bureau, I was lucky enough to be in a culture that really valued a, a lunchtime run, which also is where a lot of work got done. So benefits all around. Amazing. And last but not least, if you could go back in time, mm. what's 
one piece of advice you would give your younger self? You know, I, I, so many things may, again, I want to ask you all these questions, but I know I'm not allowed <laughs> to do that here. I want to hear your perspective. You know, I wish I had spent less time worrying about what everyone else thought of me, frankly, right? Um, professionally, certainly. Um, you know, taking care with relationships is a lot of how I've always done my job. Because again, as we talked about trust and building relationships and building a network, not just to get jobs, but to solve problems is really the bread and butter of, of how we get things done. But I think that can also slip into really over worrying about what other people think about you or if everyone's okay. And like, did I do enough? Sort of this <laughs> traditional challenge sometimes for women as well, right? And so I'm one of those people who's working to take the sorries out of my emails or the, you know, the like the thousand checking ins. And I wish, you know, at youth, I, I had had a little bit more confidence in my abilities there and spent less cycles worrying about those things. That's an amazing piece of advice. I would take that. Even now, I would still take that. I know. It's yeah, me too. I think, I'm trying to tell myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We should put a little post-it on the screen. No sorries. Um, sorry, not sorry. Uh, not sorry, not sorry. Yeah, exactly. Sasha, exactly. thank you so much for joining me today. It was enlightening and interesting and educational for me as well, which is always a privilege. And thank you so much for joining me. And I hope to see everyone again here on Cybermania. Cybermania.